Jeff Johnson, welcome to the inaugural edition of the Beat DC podcast. You are launching something brand new. Yes. Um, and I want to have, talk about a few things here today with you. I want to talk about how you got to where you are, what you're doing, and uh, what we should expect out of the upcoming show. So Fantastic. you've got a new show on BET. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, first, let me say thanks. It's um, great to be part of the inaugural podcast. That's big. Uh, I didn't know I was that important. Of course um, you're that important. <laughs> <laughs> About seven years ago, I wrote a treatment for a show called Man Cave. Um, at the time, uh, I was I was on BET primarily doing news, news content. Uh, I was a little bored with it. Uh, was frustrated that there are just tons of pieces of content um, that focus on women, women's needs. And, and we know that women are, are, are larger consumers, right? We know they consume more content. We know that content in many cases is, is created for them. But what in the hell happened to men at all? So how could we create some authentic content for men uh, that, that, that really looked at how do we have conversation, uh, but wasn't so heavy that there's no fun involved. And so, you know. So when you say fun, I mean, is it is it politics? Is it sports? Is it love? What, what's the? It's all of it. It's all and, of it. And, and it's politics more with a small P okay. than a large one. Okay. Um, I, I think that, that cable news has politics covered mm -hmm. or, or might or is trying to or, or fails at it. But whatever, that, right. that's their lane. Our goal is how do you show the complexity of men? Um, and my issue is the brothers that I know aren't these single celled amoebas who only talk about women in sports. Um, but that's what you would think if you looked at a lot of content. So I want to talk about everything. And, and not only that, I don't want it all to be smart. So I want it to be stupid. I want ignorant cats on there. It's also about, I think, giving cats permission to be themselves. Mm. Um, because in many cases, you have cats who are brilliant in one area or another and archaic in another. And it's can you create the space where we're not judging you one way or the other. And, and I think that's going to be a challenge for a lot of viewers because mm -hmm. uh, everybody wants everybody to be so damn woke that you can't say anything wrong. Right. And, and the last I checked, we aren't all woke in everything. Right. And, and like, well, and some of us claim to be woke, but we haven't read anything. Right. So, I mean, it's, 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 there's a question of what the hell does woke mean anyway. But 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 I think by and large, Jamal, the issue is where where do you see content? that exhibits the complexity of men. I, I think that uh, we're starting to see content uh, from a character perspective, character development, yeah. whether it's on screen or, or on television, that's starting to show a little bit more complex imagery of black men, but no conversation that is that is about black men for black men. Um, and for sisters who are out there that are like, well, what about me? I think the real issue is where do you get to be a fly on the wall where men are having real discussion? And while we may not be inviting you into the man cave, um, I think th there is going to be there are going to be segments that are for women. Um, but, but we're not trying to tell you how to get no man. We're not trying to tell you how to date. We're not trying to tell you how to be. No, Steve, Steve Harvey is a part of this project, right? Steve, well, well, and what's interesting is when, when I pitched this, um, I had just gotten done working on Steve's book, um, Act Like a Success, Think Like a Success. And I was okay. like, what can we continue to do together? You know, St everything Steve was touching was winning as it related to television. And I thought it was a great opportunity to see if BT was interested in being in the Steve Harvey business. So we, we went to BT, set up a meeting with Steve and some of the executives there. They love the concept. Uh, and we push from there. So Steve is an executive producer, uh, but it's unlikely you're going to see Steve on the show. It, the, the, the authenticity for us has to be first around, is this a space for honest and complex dialogue for men, period. And in the midst of that, we want it to be entertaining. We want it to be funny. We want it to be serious. We want it to have that whole range of emotions. But, but when it comes to women, the issue is just how do we give you a window to better understand why your dad won't go to the doctor? How do we give you a space to ask, how do I teach my son to pee standing up when he doesn't have an example of a man in the house? Straight up, right? right? No, that's real. That's you know, real. so so why why is my boyfriend thinking this way, doing this? He he has he's been out of work six months and he won't talk to me about it. Well, damn it, he don't want to talk to you about it. Yeah. I mean, here's the reasons why. So so we want to create spaces where women can get better understanding of how their men are thinking, the men in their lives are thinking more than how do we change you? To get you set up to have and, some man. And you're from Ohio? 
Yep, grew yeah. up in Cleveland. Grew up, grew up in Cleveland. I, I was born in Great Britain. My dad worked for the NSA, moved to D.C. for a short time, but I was raised in Cleveland. Went to University of Toledo on a track scholarship, gave it up to be a student activist. Um, only person of color at the University of Toledo ever to be president of student government, which is really absurd. Wow, wow. Uh, still, and, that's still, still true. Still. Then, you know, left there and, and became, worked for the NAACP at the national headquarters under Kwasi and Fume. And, and that was really kind of the, the shift for me. And, and anybody that knows the NAACP knows that it's got its tentacles and everything. So I was talking to CEOs as much as I was talking to entertainment executives, talking to artists, talking to, to folks at the state and federal level on the political side. And so it gave me a, a broad breadth and depth of relationships. Uh, so when I left the NAA... Wait a minute. I, I, I think of you as someone who is often looking to challenge the system and challenge the status quo. You were in one of the oldest civil rights organizations <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the probably the world, really. Um, what was that like for somebody with your personality under an organization that is so structured, so traditional... Uh, and, uh, and has so many uh, people who have been there for so long and have their way of doing business. It was awesomely frustrating. Um, I I don't think I've learned as much anywhere as I did at the NAACP. So a hundred years of history, a hundred years of process, a hundred years of, of trial and error, um, and probably one of the most robust communities of volunteers. So every city I go into, there's somebody that's like my aunt or my uncle whose house I can stay at who's teaching me what real civil rights is. So, yeah. so as much as I'm learning from Kwesi and Fume, who's former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and 13 years in the House and, um, and, and has some real legitimate legislative experience, I'm learning as much from the sister in Natchez, Mississippi, who nobody knows, who does this work day in and day out. So it was brilliant for me as, as a pre-30 year old who, where, where there's no social media and you didn't yet think that just because you graduated, you were supposed to be leading a meeting. Um, I enjoy carrying bags because I got to be in meetings that I hadn't worked to deserve to be in, but I got to have the benefit of hearing those conversations. Just shadowing them yes. day by day, isn't yes. it? It's like going to graduate school, yes. right? Well, and the blessing of nobody expecting you to speak. Right. So, so literally, right, how amazing is it to be in high-level meetings where nobody needs you to tell them what to do? Nobody's looking for your ideas. Nobody's. And, and, and I don't know if young professionals always appreciate that as much as they should. I learned more in those meetings, right. not ex being expected to talk and having access to high level conversation because I didn't have to prove what I knew. Um, in fact, they knew what I didn't know. And, and, and I was there to be able to. So, so it was amazing in that regard. Well, I want to get to yeah. how you got from the NAACP to BET, where you became kind of a voice of a generation as they were digesting news and politics? Well, I, I got to TV unlike most people ever get to TV. So I, I was in New York. We were building the Hip Hop Summit Action Network. I was working with Dr. Ben Chavis and Russell. Because um, that was really kind of this, this um, rise of quote-unquote hip hop politics in a formal way. So I was in New York hustling to make some money. And one day... Um, somebody said, Stephen Hill brought your name up. And Stephen Hill at the time was president of entertainment, um, had created Rap City and created 106 in Park. And frankly, Jam people may know Stephen Hill from the New Edition movie. If they, they have never they, seen they, his they, face they, may. they may. They <laughs> may. Right. They may. And, and Jamal, honestly, I just was willing to meet with anybody that would buy lunch. Yeah. Like, I didn't care who it was. I'm, I'm going to the meeting. And I walked into Stephen's office and he said, Jeff, would you like to be on TV? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, I want to put you on 106 in Park or Rap City, but I don't know how. And I said, I can't do 106 because they yelling the whole time. I love AJ and Free, but it's right. just on a thousand right. from the time it starts to the time it ends. I said, look, me and Ticket can talk about a topic a, a week. I can come in. We can talk about it. I can be out. And he was like, bet. Uh, you're going to be Ticket's cousin. Uh, we're going to call you Cousin Jeff. We're going to start taping next week. And I'm like, Cousin Jeff, uh, it's already BT. It sounds a little Bama. I'm not with it. I said, the question for me is, will you ever sanction me? He said, I said, will you ever censor me? He said, no. And literally, BT gave me the space to be myself, to talk about any issue I wanted to at a time where there wasn't social commentary on rap video shows. And so right. it was just a brilliant way to merge everything I had been doing in the activism space, um, in the mainstream media space. You call yourself uh, a teller of stories. Yes. What's the most compelling story that you've ever told? Wow. Um, 
I don't know if there's a most, and, and Jamal, you know, because you've traveled all over the place. The question is, how do we just make sure the stories have impact? But I'll be really honest with you. One of the most important experiences I ever had by way of a piece of content, I was at Dream, for those in D.C. who un remember Dream before love. Yes. And, um, and, and Dream was after Republic Guard. Yes. <laughs> for the, for so those I'm, really I'm chilling, like right. totally and completely disconnected. This guy comes up to me and was like, yo, Jeff, I just want to say thank you for talking about the nuclear option. And I'm like, dude, seriously, what the hell are you talking about? Where's right. the cameras? I'm getting punked. And he was like, yo, nobody brings us that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so here's what somebody stopped me in a club in D.C. to talk about a Supreme Court engagement um, in the U.S. Senate. And, and that just said to me, people are listening, they're watching, they want the information, they want the content. They just don't want you to make, they don't want you to make them feel like they're stupid. When so they're are not. people stopping you now to ask you about President Trump? Yeah, I mean. And what I, do you say? Uh, you know, let's roll. I, you, it, it, here's the thing. I remember how polarizing things were after Bush got elected. Yeah. Um, after Florida, after after people felt like it was stolen. And while I don't I don't liken Bush to Trump in a lot of uh, hardcore policy ways, I reckon I remember when people thought it was the end of the world. Um, and so I, I think Trump and his administration is incredibly problematic to what many of us believe democracy should be. Mm -hmm. I also still believe in uh, government having checks and balances to the degree that even in a Republican controlled House, we have the ability to still voice our concerns, engage um, the Congress, fight for the things we believe in, and ride out this storm in a way that hopefully, if we're diligent and we're intentional, it's not as bad as it could be if we're not. Yeah, and uh, some people may know this from, from seeing it, but uh, you have known, as I have, uh, Omarosa for a long time. Dude, Omarosa introduced me to my wife. So, so, you know her, so, right. so when, when people saw me at the wedding was like, damn it, Jeff, yeah. what the hell are you doing at Omarosa's wedding? I'm like, dude, she introduced me to my wife. She knows my kids. And so. Uh, so do you all talk politics? No. You, you, you've yeah. worked on campaigns. You've yeah. done advertising. But, but, but you know as well as I do, like these D.C. political conversations almost, they're just going in circles. I'd rather talk to strategists that are interested in doing work. Mm -hmm. And so I, I am so frustrated with some of the political discourse because I think there was a time when we talked about politics, we actually wanted to get somewhere. Yeah. Now I just feel like we're political ideologues that we're just shouting each other, trying to get each other to agree with where we are. And that's bullshit. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's I, I want us to create an America that's better, not in some cliche way. But, but policy and legislation is, is really about how do you change people's lives. And if all we're doing is beating each other over the heads with ideology, neither side is getting there. And I, I just don't have a lot of patience for what I hear on either side of the aisle by way of conversation, because it doesn't always translate to I'm actually doing work to help move this policy or push this agenda or create this reality. Those are the people who I love talking to, because even when we disagree, we're trying to get to a place, not of agreement, but of understanding, so that whatever we're creating, whether it's in a, a nonprofit space or a policy space, the, the, the sum goal is how do we change people's lives? So as we, as we cycle out uh, of, our, of our episode today, mm -hmm. are you more concerned with talking to men who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, or men who are in their 20s? The only way this show works is multi-generational. Um, but we're, we're speaking to polyethnic urbanites, to be clear. Um, we don't want to leave out millennial voices. We don't want to leave out Xer voices. We don't want to leave out those in between. I think that's what's going to make it so dope. The thing is, how do we get um, Xers who have millennial appeal? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want somebody that's coming in beating up young people. Yeah. I, I'm not with that at all. Um, but I do want somebody that's lived enough and still loves young people enough to be able to have the kind of exchange where people sit back and was like, yo, that dude was crazy. And who's your fantasy? If you could do a fantasy pairing. Oh, dude. If you, got, um, if you could do, you know. Fantasy pairing would be Colin Powell and ASAP Rocky. Oh, that's dope. <laughs> <laughs> Oh,